And um, I want to talk today about the wilderness. An interesting topic. Um, but I, hopefully we'll unpack some thoughts. And I, I've taken three ideas or three moments from the Bible all about the wilderness. Um, and we're going to kind of unpack it. And the title today is Confronting the Wilderness. And, and so I kind of, when I was thinking about the wilderness, I think a lot of us have quite a one-dimensional view of, of what a wilderness might be. Right, we'll just think of a kind of a remote area, a desolate space. We'll think of uh, mountains and howling winds and dangerous animals. And we'll go, okay, it's kind of like an untamed land. That's what we think of when we think of the wilderness. But I actually think the wilderness can actually be more multidimensional. We can use it metaphorically to represent different areas, places we might not go, places we're afraid of. And I kind of, as when I was thinking about the wilderness and what it represented, for me, it came down to one thing. It's an uncertainty. You don't know what the wilderness is going to bring. It's uncharted. It's untamed. And so when we step into the wilderness, we're stepping into uncertain territory. Now, this can be uncertainty in your mind. This can be uncertainty in your situation. This can be an uncertainty of identity. There's lots of areas of uncertainty that the wilderness can represent. And you know, the Bible actually talks about the wilderness 300 times around. It's not like there's just a couple of people stepping into the wilderness here and there and it's like the odd thing. They go into the wilderness a lot. Jesus went into the wilderness. There were lots of people in the Old Testament that went into the wilderness. And as I was looking through, they actually, in the translations, had different words for the wilderness to mean different things. And a lot of the early part kind of with Moses, that they, the wilderness that they referred to was called the Midbar. And then it, it changed. And when Jesus went to the, the wilderness, it was called um, Erebah or something like that off the top of my head. And that meant uh, a place of isolation. And it had different meanings for the different purposes of people's presence in the wilderness. And um, I kind of feel like I... I have two ways with my own wilderness. I feel like I can be in a, a space of uncertainty about a lot of things. Where am I going? What am I doing here? What's the point of my life? Like, does God actually care what I'm doing? I can feel sometimes like the Israelites in their wilderness. When am I going to get to the promised land of what I think God has got for me? Those kind of wilderness. But sometimes I really like a wilderness adventure. I'm like, I'm so ready. I really want to go like right out to like Alaska and go like kayaking through some fjords where there's no one there and I see a grizzly bear. Like that sounds like a great adventure to me. And so I kind of want to go to the wilderness, but at the same time, I really don't like being in uncertainty in my life. So it's a bit of a confusing space. And I think back to some of the times where I have found the wilderness. I remember um, when I was 19, I got really lucky. I got to go to Australia and some would say that's kind of a, you could classify that as a, a wilderness, right? Not because it's a scary place, but it's an un uncertainty, right? Something new. But I was unfazed going to Australia. I, I walked into the airport. I didn't look back when I said goodbye to my brother and my dad. And I was like, adios, see you later. <laughs> it just disappeared. I wasn't afraid of, of that wilderness. But I remember one time me and my brother, we'd just come off a scuba diving holiday in the Red Sea. And our diving instructors um, they were like, oh, we're going we're gonna to go into the desert and have a drink. And Sam was like, yeah, let's go, Tom, we're going to go. And I was like, hmm. Like part of my brain was like, this could go really wrong. Do I go into the desert with the people I've known for a week with my brother? But Sam was all for it. So I was like, I'll go, you know, I'll make, look after Sam. We went into like just the middle of the Egyptian, <laughs> like the Egyptian desert to this like camp thing. And we just had a drink around a fire. And it was really not, it was like a really random wilderness moment. But there was a lot of uncertainty there. I've been skiing, and I, I know I've, I've done a lot of cool things, and I'm really, really thankful for that. But I, when I ski, I don't like to ski just down the slope. I like to go right off piste, where you don't know quite out of the marked territory. And sometimes if you ever look like scrolling on um, Instagram or YouTube or whatever, sometimes there's the thing, and there's like this guy, I saw it once, and he was a snowboarder. He'd been snuck un stuck under the snow where he'd gone under, and a skier had found him, had to dig him out. There's danger in the wilderness. And wilderness can feel very different when we apply it to our own lives. It can be the feeling of being lost, maybe you're, of being abandoned. It can be impatience, waiting on a promise. It could be a transitioning out of 
friendships or relationships. It might be going through challenge where you feel vulnerable. Maybe it's having unrealized dreams and no certainty on how to make them happen. Or even just feeling isolated from God and unsure of your place in the world. And today, the whole thing is about confronting your wilderness because everybody has one. At some point, you're going to have moments of uncertainty, moments where you feel vulnerable and in an unsure place. But that's part of the process of being human, where we wrestle with the uncertainty and we decide on what is truth. And so today, I'm gonna appeal to you to find your truth in God and His promise for your life. And the wilderness can feel like an unforgiving place, maybe. And I want to take some time to look through some of the different experiences, as I said, and through understanding people's process in the wilderness, how we can apply it to our lives. Michael, I love you. Thank you. Sometimes I just like to look at Michael. I don't know, we have a special bond. Anyway, I'm going to start off with uh, Moses. Moses has been on my heart for a while. No matter what the preach kind of went to, I was going to do it on Moses. So this is just kind of where I settled. And I was a bit annoyed because I was sat in a a coffee shop with Chloe um, and I was talking through my first preach idea. And I was like, I've got this idea. I'm going to talk about this and this and this is going to be so good. I'm going to go here, here, here. Moses, Moses, Moses. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And Chloe's like, oh, so good, Tom. And then I got to writing the preach. I'd forgotten everything I said. Couldn't remember it for the life of me. And so that idea was gone. And that really annoyed me. So lesson one, write things down. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Moses first. Um, and Moses' experience in the wilderness was, uh, it was prolonged. And it was kind of very different to a lot of the other experiences Uh, in the wilderness. And Moses, right from the off, was confronted with two types of wilderness. He had the physical wilderness that he went to, the geographical place, and he also had the mental wilderness of the uncertainty of who he was, right? Um, And his kind of identity was uncertain. He'd been brought up one way, he'd been, knew his heritage, and they didn't match up. And so Moses was in quite a a wild place. He was brought up like a prince in a palace. He had an education and resource and a future and opportunity. But he was also aware of his heritage, that he was a Hebrew of Hebrew ancestry, right? And Moses didn't realize from very early on in Exodus 2 when he went and saved the Hebrew worker that he was actually outworking his identity. And it's funny how often you'll be outworking God's calling and God's promise for you, but completely unsure of it. And it takes a journey and a pathway to end up right back where you started. Moses was called to be a freer of the oppressed. And God took him on a long journey to get there, but he was already doing it right from the off. He wasn't, st- he wasn't gonna stand to see his people abused, yeah, and beaten. And so he took action. Maybe not the best action. He took action. And from that, this led on a series of events where Moses kind of didn't quite understand what was going on, and he fled to a place called Midian. Now, Midian was a desert wilderness. Now, Moses went to the wilderness this time, not because he wanted to, but because he was afraid. He was afraid of repercussions from his actions. And so he went uh, accidentally, or there's another word for it, um, but I can't remember it, so, you know. He went without intending to, unintentionally. There we go. He went unintentionally, right? And his wilderness, as I said for Moses, his wilderness was an uncertainty of identity. He'd gone believing he was, you know, part of the prince's family, confused about his heritage, and now he's in the desert wilderness as a shepherd. He'd gone from the very top in Egypt to the very bottom very quickly, And so he had a great uncertainty about who he was. And he was in the wilderness. Who was he? Where did he belong? Where did he need to go? What was the purpose of his life? His life had completely been flipped upside down. But the thing that I love about God is that God never just leaves you where you are. Right? Our God is one who restores no matter what the events or the things that we do in our life. God is outworking his plan and his purpose in our life. And we're going to take a look at Exodus 3 and just have a quick read through um, Exodus 3. And it says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses. I could do that better, actually. Moses, Moses. There we go. Come on. I think that's how God speaks. And in verse eight, it says, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt. He's explaining what he's doing. And I, I'm gonna go into that in a minute. Into their own fertile and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, that was really good, now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my, pe my people Israel out of Egypt. And in Exodus 2, it says right in the last line, and I love this, God knew he had to act. When God has a plan, when God says, I'm going to act, he does it. And he uses his people to make that plan happen. So he was explaining what he was going to do. And there's a couple of things that we're going to learn from Moses. How am I doing on time? Wonderful. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is that Moses, not the first time, but the second time, he entered the wilderness purposefully and he encountered God there. It says right at the beginning, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai. Now, these two things kind of don't really add up, right? We don't expect to find God in the wilderness. But I actually challenge that. I actually think that when we step out into creation, into nature, when we provide a bit of solitude and peacefulness, and we take off some of the comforts, some of the ease, some of the certainty of our life, when we step into the wilderness and we go there willingly, that's where you can find God sometimes. That's where God encounters us. It's not always in the comfort. Church is extremely comfortable. And I will be honest, I've been here and have completely not encountered God on a Sunday before. It's true. And I'm sure all of you have. You've stepped in. It's been good. Worship's cracking. The preach is good. And you leave and everything's over and you're looking forward to lunch. Because it's comfortable. Now, when I went to India on a mission trip, we went and we were in, it was just a hangar warehouse. We had an acoustic guitar that was really out of tune. And the songs were in, is it in India, Hindi? Yeah, it was in Hindi. And when I was singing with my out of tune guitar in Hindi, let me tell you, I experienced God. Now, my legs were covered in insect bites because I'd been sleeping on an orphanage floor. My pillow was brown with sweat because it was like 40 degrees and the warehouse was baking. But we spent three to four hours in worship with an out of tune guitar and I experienced God almost more than I have for ages because we stripped back some of the comforts. Next week, I'll bring the untuned acoustic guitar, don't you worry. And I'll be getting all of you in. We'll raise up the, the temperature. We'll make it happen. But sometimes we have to go into that wilderness place. Now Moses entered the wilderness purposefully. Before he'd been running away, he ran to Midian out of fear, not because he wanted to go there, but because he was fleeing for his life. But here he'd grown accustomed to the wilderness. He knew where he was. And he wanted to press in a bit more. And sometimes the wilderness allows us to reflect. And one of the things I think the wilderness did and Midian did for Moses was to teach him some humility. I don't think God would have quite been able to do what he did. And he wouldn't have been able to use Moses the way he had if Moses hadn't become teachable. If he hadn't allowed some of that pride to kind of be released. He was a shepherd working under Jethro, going from a palace. Now he was a shepherd. And so I think that when we go into new places, into the wilderness, 
When we enter places of uncertainty, whether that be a new job, a new place, a new experience, a new relationship, you know, we have to go in expecting and being purposeful that God can move in that situation. We can't let uncertainty define those situations. Moses moved right through into the deep wilderness. And as I said, when we strip back our comforts and allow ourselves into a position of vulnerability, that's where God can encounter us. And um, I was just thinking about this because it's funny because you've got to have a trust. I love what Esther just said before. Trust in God. And that's a real test for me. Um, I'm, quite, I'm quite fickle. I know I'm quite fickle. In my, my foundation's good, but my like, day-to-day is a bit up and down. Um, and so like, one day I'll, I'll be with Chloe and I'll be like, God hates me today. God literally is chun- he's out for me. Because if this had happened the way I wanted it to, everything would be working. And the next bit, I come back and I'm like, sorry, Chloe, like, I know God's good, everything's fine. And I kind of have to, but I'm a bit up and down like that. It's really quite hard work. Um, but I was, thinking, I was thinking about the time that um, I was on the high ropes, back when I was a kid. And Esther told the story about Chloe having to jump, right? And so I was up, kind of, you climbed all the, you do all the high ropes. And then there's this thing called the leap of faith. Has anyone done a leap of faith before? Yeah, there's some leap of faithers out here, I see you. Right, and so you're on, and it's like this, it's not very, it's like half a meter, and you have to balance on it, and you're standing there, and it's kind of wobbling, because it's quite high up in the air, and there's a bar, like a meter and a bit in front of you, and you have to jump and grab the bar. Now, that takes a bit of faith to go out into that wilderness, because I don't know about you, but I don't want to die, and I don't always trust harnesses, right? Like, I was a kid who was like, they're like, you're really safe if you're strapped in, and I was like, let me test it. <clears throat> and then I have to test if the rope caught me. So you're doing this and you're there and you're like kind of wobbling on this thing. You have to uh, jump and grab the high rope, right? Going into the wilderness can be like that. But when you go in expectant and trusting that God is going to meet you in your wilderness, the high rope is far less scary. Yeah? The high rope is far less scary. And when God does turn up, He's going to turn up in the most miraculous way but we have to take the faith to step into the wilderness and believe that God can do it in the wilderness. Where am I? Cool, good. In the wilderness, yeah. I see you. All right, I'm going to go on to point two, um, just because that's what I'm going to do. And my point two is that the environment may seem uncertain, but God's will and power is certain. When we say we can trust in who God says he is, We have to trust in who God says he is. There is no point us flitting one minute, oh, God is this. And the next moment going, well, God hasn't done this, so he's not true. We have to have a certainty. And this is the real thing about faith, right? Is we might not see it every day. We might not see it happen in our lifetime. But we've got to stand on the truth that God is who he is, even if we don't see it. And when Moses went into the wilderness, he saw the the angel, the bush, the blazing fire standing before him because God had decided he needed to take action. And and I don't think Moses had expected to see that in the wilderness. He was tending his sheep. But when God has a plan and God wants to outwork something, that is a certainty. And that's what I wanted to say. Look at that. Now, the wilderness is a crazy place for God to meet Moses. But I don't know if you've ever walked through a time of hardship or difficulty or stress or things where you're not sure how it's going to happen. You're not sure how you're going to have the money to do that. You're not sure if that is actually the way you need to go. You're not sure if this is the person that you should be with. You're not sure if this is the place that you should be living. There are parts of uncertainty. And God is most likely going to show up in those moments of uncertainty because the truth is, when everything's going fine, you're not looking for God. And that's the truth of Western Christianity. It's nice to do, but it's only when things get a bit difficult that we actually start looking. And if we know that God is there and open and knocking on the door, it's only when we step out into that wilderness 
that God can start to do the crazy things that we sing and talk and hope for him to do. He's not going to do it if we're just sitting in our comfortable, easy places. And we can be certain of who God says that he is. So point three, and this is the bit that I'm getting to, the good bit. It was good before, but this is the good bit. Is that God clarified Moses' identity so that he could move into his calling, right? Moses had come unsure of who he was, uncertain. He was a, a prince for a minute. He was a Hebrew descendant. And now he's a shepherd in Midian. Who is he? What is he doing? But in Exodus 4, the whole like, rest of the chapter is, saying, is God confirming Moses' identity and he making his purpose clear. And even in your wilderness, God is ever-present and ever-powerful. Moses believed probably that he was alone in the wilderness. His sheep were there, and it was him. A bit of quiet reflection time. But God's presence was made clearly known to Moses, and God's presence can be made clearly known to you. You don't need a burning bush and an angel for God's truth to be made clear to you. It's in the Bible. Now, God will find us no matter where we are, no matter your uncertainty or your situation or your struggle, God's glory is true and certain and he can find you. And your wilderness will never be bigger than God. Moses was never alone in the wilderness because God was always right there with him. In Exodus 4.12, it says, and God said, I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on the mountain. God says, I will be with you. God had a plan for Moses. Moses fleeing to Midian, lost and confused, was maybe part of that plan. It's not always a nice thing, but maybe that was part of the plan. He'd gone, as I said, educated to a shepherd, confused. And maybe you felt like that. I know I felt like that so many times. God, I'm here right now. I didn't really want to be here, but here I am now. Where am I going next? What am I doing? And it's, it's really, what I'm looking for is a certain answer from God. And I'm not getting it always. And that's what tests your faith, isn't it? Because you don't have the certainty. You've got to trust that God's plan is outworking the way he wants it to work without the certainty of an angel coming and saying it to you. And then this is what God does to confirm Moses' identity. He explains who he is. He clarifies who he is because for our, our understanding of God enables our understanding of who we are. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Yeah. Only in understanding who God was could Moses begin to understand who he was. And in the conversation that follows in Exodus 4, Moses kind of gives every reason why he shouldn't do it. He disqualifies himself because his identity, who he believed he was, was right down at rock bottom as that lowly shepherd. But God then says this, and I'm going to kind of summar up the, summarize the conversation. Moses asks a question and God gives a response. Moses says, who am I that should be doing this? God says, I will be with you. They will listen to you. Moses says, they won't believe me. God says, then I will show them. Moses says, I can't speak well enough. God says, I made you and formed your mouth. Moses said, send someone else because I am not worthy. God says, you will go with your brother and he will be your mouth and I will help you both. God replies to all of Moses' doubts about himself. When you say that you are not enough, God says that he is with you and that he is enough. When you says that they won't let me do something, God says, well, let me handle them. When you says, say, I'm not enough, God says, I formed you by your hand. And when you say, I can't, God says, I will go with you and I will give you a community and a family to bring you through it. Our first lessons from the wilderness and from Moses are that when you're uncertain about yourself and your purpose, that God will meet you in your wilderness, God will clarify your identity and he will clarify your purpose and that he is ever certain, ever trustworthy and ever present and powerful. Yeah. However, Moses wasn't quite done in the wilderness. 
And we're going to move on and just have a quick look at the Israelites and what we can learn from them. Now, the Israelites, they're kind of probably the most famous um, wilderness story, the 40 years. Um, and it was really interesting. I'd really like, maybe someone can tell me after, uh, or I could just Google it, but if someone can tell me, I'd like to know the significance of wilderness and 40. Why 40 years? And then why did Jesus spend 40 days? If anyone knows, let me know. Um, anyway, there are four books in the Bible that speak of the Israelites' journey from Egypt. Exodus, it speaks about their deliverance into the wilderness. Leviticus is all about the laws that they needed to learn. Numbers concerns their journey to the promised land. And Deuteronomy concerns the Israelites entering the promised land. We have four quite long Old Testament books of the Bible, all about the Israelites' experience in the wilderness. Now, if God has said, four books of my Bible need to be devoted to this period of the Israelites' journey, there's got to be a lot of things that we can take from this. Okay? Now, throughout the Israelites' journey, and I love the Israelites because the Israelites are me. They're fantastic, and they make me feel so much better about my life. Because the Israelites, they mess up over and over and over again. It's just the best thing, right? Not for them, obviously. They were terrible. But it's great to read about. They mess up. They experience God's discipline and his anger. The amount of times, like, I love it in the Bible, God was done with them. And Moses was like, please, God, don't be done with the Israelites. And then he's not. It's just, like, so good. But they spent a long time in the wilderness because they just could not get their faith right. They spent time worshipping pagan gods, fighting with each other, ignoring God's rules, rebelling against people, complaining about the food, worshipping other pagan gods. And doesn't that just summarize our Christian journey? Like one minute we're like, God, you're so good. Thank you for providing food. The next minute we're like, flipping it. God, I'm so done with this. Can you give me a, like something else? And we just go back and forth. How much time do we waste being like the Israelites, going from one minute God's so good to the next minute God isn't good enough and I'm going to go do something else? The reason I think he spent so long with the Israelites and wanted us is because they are literally so like us. And what a challenge for us to go, do you know what? We talk about trusting God. We sing about trusting God. Why don't I actually just trust God? Man, it's so good. Anyway, eventually their unbelief, rebellion, led them to wandering for 40 years. Now, as far as I got from the research and the looking into what I did, it's because God wanted some people to die off. The rebellious, kind of unfaithful group of Israelites, he was like, do you know what? I'm kind of done with you. I need the new faithful generation to rise up. That next faithful generation, am I right? And so they were wandering. And we have a lot to learn from this because they had been given or told about the promised land that they were going to enter into. And I don't know about you, but I can sometimes feel like this, that I've been wandering in a wilderness of uncertainty for a long time. And there's going to be things, because the only thing that we can change is ourselves. We can't change God. We can't change other people. We might not be able to change situations. So all we can focus on is ourselves. And so if I take what the Israelites had, maybe there's things that, some things that they were doing that maybe could shorten my wandering so that I could get into the promise. I don't want to spend my life wandering. I want to spend my life in the promise. Right? So... What was the Israelites' issue? Maybe they were afraid. Afraid that the promise wouldn't look the way they wanted to. Afraid that they weren't worthy of the promise. Afraid that they wouldn't actually get there and it wasn't what God had told them it would be. Maybe they were afraid of the obstacles and the issues they'd have to go through to get there. And maybe the Israelites were short-sighted. They couldn't see the promise that was ahead of them and so they only focused on the present. We've got to be future seers. By that, I don't mean like mystics. I mean like we've got to look into the promise that God has. Just to clarify that, we're not preaching mystics here today. That's next week, all right? <laughs> Joking. The other good thing about God is that he values free will. If God was just like, look, Israelites, you do this, make it happen, march here, do this, and they just did it, it wouldn't really be a good story. It'd just be chain and command, right? We have to have free will. We have to get ourselves there. We have to learn. We have to have, as I said about the beginning, that wrestle within ourselves to get us to the place that we need to go. 
So, first off, a couple of lessons. The lesson of the golden calf. Get yourself one. Joking. <laughs> so, the first major sin of Israel. Moses was up on the mountain in Mount Sinai, and he was taking a little while. The Israelites got impatient. They were like, Moses, you're taking a long time, my friend. I'm sitting here in the desert, bored. Aaron, my friend, Moses is done. He's been 20 minutes. Get us something to worship, <laughs> right? And so Aaron was like, good idea. Give me all of your gold. And then he ran, no, he didn't run away. He created a golden calf. And so in the space of Moses being up communing with God, the Israelites had already decided that that was too long. They weren't patient enough for that. And so they started worshiping the golden calf, started doing sins and things in the name of the golden calf. It didn't take long for the Israelites to abandon God and choose something else to worship. Now, when God calls us to worship him and says, you will have no other gods but me, he means it. He wants us to worship and keep our eyes solely fixed on him. Now, the Israelites had a golden calf, but we can have so many other things that we will replace and use as idols. It might be a partner. It might be a job. It might be money. There are many things in life that can come and grab our attention that we put way more of our time into than worshipping our God. So instead of finding idols to keep us company, what have we got to do? We've got to keep praying and keep seeking God, even when we're sat waiting in the wilderness. In Numbers 13, and I'm switching up a bit, the Israelites were close to the promised land and they sent out the spies to go and have a look. Now the scouts saw armies up and down the land, obstacles, challenges, and they didn't quite like what they saw because their, you know, their human eyes said, we can't go through here. This isn't going to be good for us. They didn't trust that God could carry them through and deliver on his promise. And so God punished them. If you're not going to believe in what I've told you is going to happen, I'm not going to do this with you. You can wander. Wander for 40 years if you want to. The promised land was filled with powerful armies, scary things, obstacles. But when God says he's going to deliver a promise, we have to be certain and true that God is going to deliver that promise. And the future might be frightening. There might be things that you never thought that you would be able to do, places you never thought that you'd be able to go, people to influence that you never thought you'd be able to influence. And it doesn't matter the obstacle, because if God has called you to go there, you are going to go there. All it takes is for you to step in and trust that he has got that plan for you. God has a plan to get you from the place that you are right now and take you to the place that he has assigned for you. He has that plan. He wants to outwork that plan with you. He wanted to outwork it with Moses. He wanted to outwork it with the Israelites. And it was only because of our stubbornness, our disobedience, our fickleness, our impatience that God couldn't get there. I'd love to go back and ask, if the Israelites had just done what you asked, how quickly would they have got there? Yeah. <laughs> A lot sooner. But following God always requires faith. Always requires faith. And the Israelites struggled with their faith because waiting on a promise that you can't quite see happen yet is difficult to do. Yeah. It's easy. I, I was talking about this. With Chloe, some things I don't count as goals, right? She'd be like, what's your goals? And so, for example, um, it might be like, we'd say we'd, when we were moving house, oh, I'd love to move house by the end of the year. I already know that I'm moving house by the end of the year. It's not a goal, right? Just because it hasn't happened yet, it's not a goal because it's, cert it's certain for me, right? If I was like, I'd love to have made a million pounds by the end of the year, that's a bit of a goal because it's not certain that it's going to happen, right? And it takes faith. If I say I'm 100% on that goal, it takes faith to step out and go and make it happen. It's not taking faith if I know that something is there and going to happen. It takes faith to trust in God's promises, all right? And the road might not be easy. But when we walk in faith and we walk with God, we go back to Moses and go that he will never fail us. He is with us. He has called us. If they're not going to listen, God will make them listen, right? We rely on God as our tool and our strength. Finally, in the last couple of minutes, I want to just have a look at Jesus. Jesus purposefully went into the wilderness. And we're going to look at it in Matthew 4. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, 
to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted, became hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. A couple of quick points from this. Firstly, Satan is not creative. The temptations Jesus faced in the wilderness were nothing new. The tricks that Satan employs against us are nothing new. He uses the same thing over and over and he uses them now. Satan tempted Jesus with food. So physical needs and desires, the things your body tells you you want. He tempted Jesus with a kingdom. He will often tempt us with power or superiority over others. And he tempted Jesus to prove who he is. He challenged Jesus' identity. All of the temptations, sometimes the struggle of the wilderness and uncertainty, there are things that tempt us because of that uncertainty. If I go this way, if I spend a little less time at church, I'll have a little more time to focus on this project to make some more money. It's an easy one to do. If I don't go to prayer meeting on Wednesday, I'll have a little more time to sleep so I won't be so tired on Thursday. Physical needs, right? Or is it power and superiority? If I spend a little less time praying, I can spend more time trying to influence those people around me. Or maybe it's, I'm not sure of who I am because you know, kind of what I believed about myself isn't true. So I'm going to go and seek this. I've not done too well at church. It hasn't quite meant what I thought it would. So I'm going to go try that in another sphere. That's what I did at university. Church didn't really work for me so much at university. It didn't really connect, didn't really get on with it. It wasn't as good as here. And so what did I do? I went and I was really successful at American football. Great, but not quite what God had planned. I was MVP two times in a row. I was really good at it. But it's not quite what God had planned. Let me tell you, it didn't get me any closer to knowing Him. I wasn't praying anymore. God has a plan and it's easy to change your identity when things aren't working out. And He tempts you away. But what did Jesus do? He fought the temptation with Scripture. Every time, the Scripture says this. Your biggest weapon when you are in the wilderness is the Scripture. Because what does the Scripture do? What does the Bible do? It shows us the certainty of God. So when you're in an uncertain position or an uncertain situation or you're feeling uncertain about your life, where can you find the truth? In the Scripture. If you're not spending time reading it, and I've been really challenging myself in this since having a baby, I haven't read as much Bible as I should. And I can see when it's affecting me because I've been in a moody mood at points. Our greatest weapon is the Word of God. Each time Satan laid out a temptation in the wilderness, Jesus combated it, combated it with Scripture. And sometimes Satan will try and twist those Scriptures for us to try and trick Jesus, to take the Bible out of context so we can meet the desires that we believe or the things that we want. But knowledge of God, knowledge of His truth, knowledge of His certainty is what will help you confront your wilderness. If we're just ready to stand. And I just want to pray over everyone here today because at some point you will face a wilderness, a moment of uncertainty, a moment of doubt about yourself and your situation and your position in this world. And I just want to encourage you. You are called here for a purpose. Your life has meaning. You are wanted. And there's a verse in Psalms that says, the Lord delights in you. God delights in you today. 
So we're just gonna pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your truth, for Your certainty. We thank You that You are the same God from the very beginning to the very end and that nothing we do can change who You are. We thank You that You love us so deeply that You gave Your Son for us. We thank You that You gave us Your Word so that we can fight temptation, fight uncertainty, fight doubt, fight the lies of the enemy with Your truth and Your Word. And I just pray over people and your church right now. I pray over those struggling with their identity, with who they are and who they're called to be. And we just call them champions in your kingdom. They are sons and daughters. They are loved. And we just thank you that the identity, our identity can be confirmed in your word and in who you are. I am who I am. Your truth is ever present and ever certain. And Father, I pray for those this morning who are struggling with their situation. What should I be doing? Where should I be going? Where do I fit? God, I pray that You would provide clarity for them right now. That they would see the truth. That their wilderness would not seem like a scary place as they strip back some of their comforts. And in their vulnerability, they encounter You, Father. We pray for that encounter this week, this moment, right now, Father. We thank You that You can do all things and that You are good at all times. Father, we thank You for Your church. We love You, we honour You and we praise You. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.